I'd like you to imagine someone knitting a scarf. What does this person look like? What are they wearing? Where are they sitting? Now, I'd like you to imagine someone programming an app. What does this person look like? Where are they sitting? What are they wearing? I'm going to guess that you didn't imagine the same person. <laughs> I'm going to guess that when you imagine someone knitting, you probably imagined a woman, probably older, maybe your mother or grandmother sitting at home. And when you imagine a programmer, probably imagine a man, probably younger, maybe hunched over a keyboard in a really hip office, maybe like this. <laughs> These stereotypes are pretty much universal. But these two practices are much more closely related than you might think. Understanding this relationship can create entry points for people who otherwise may struggle to find their way into the tech space. And understanding this relationship might change our perceptions of who we think belongs in that space. I am a designer, technologist, educator, and crafter. I recently graduated from New York University with my master's in interactive telecommunications. And for the past two and a half years, I have been researching the overlap of craft and tech. Today, I want to talk about those interwoven histories and what this can mean for the future. But first, I want to start by addressing an issue that plagues the tech space, a lack of diversity and inclusion. Belonging is very important to us humans. At a very young age, we're taught to point out the thing that doesn't belong, and it sticks with us. Has anyone here ever gone to a party wearing jeans and realized everybody else was in formal attire? <laughs> Or has anybody here ever gone to a company meeting and realized that you're the only woman? If we look at major tech companies, um, such as Apple, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Twitter, only one in five tech positions are filled by women. And that is not the only group that's underrepresented. Only three out of 100 tech positions are filled by people who are Hispanic or Latino and only one in 100 of those positions are filled by someone who is black. These companies make decisions that impact the entire world, but the world is not being represented. Hiring practices of these companies is just, as, just a part of a much larger issue, but today I want to focus on one example of where this comes from. A recent study by Girls Who Code, an organization dedicated to uh, closing the gender gap in tech, found that three out of four middle school-aged girls uh, had an interest in science, engineering, and math. But when those girls go to apply for college, only three out of a thousand choose computer science as a major. The likelihood of a girl choosing computer science as a major increases 25% if she just believes that coding is for girls. But it decreases 33% if she doesn't believe she'll have any friends in her class. So it all comes back down to belonging. But why don't girls feel like they belong? Why do we imagine that craft is for old ladies and tech is for young men? Why do we think of these as kind of opposite things? But to answer that question, let's look at history. Starting around 1750, we have this great time called the Industrial Revolution. It starts in Great Britain and spreads around the world. And we have this new idea of industry. So we have to also define what isn't industry. And we come up with this idea of craft. So 
industry is mass-produced and um, machine-made, and craft is handmade and inefficient, and <laughs> industry is progressive and masculine, and craft is conservative and feminine, and then craft, you know, serves to preserve the past, while industry and technology are representative of aspirations for the future. But prior to the Industrial Revolution, we only had the idea of things that were human-made. So craft and technology are the same thing. They're human innovation. They only became separate when it became politically useful to divide them. So let's look at some examples. I want to start with weaving. During the Industrial Revolution, a, an English mathematician, inventor, and engineer, Charles Babbage, became completely fascinated with this brand new invention called the Jacquard loom. And this loom revolutionized textile making. But to understand just how great it was, it's helpful to understand a little bit about weaving. A woven fabric has threads that run vertically and horizontally. The warp threads go on the loom first, and they run vertically. And the horizontal threads are the weft, and they're woven into the warp threads. And this forms an interlocking structure. The jacquard loom is fed a set of pre-punched cards that control the configuration of the, of the threads. So each card contains information specific to one row. Whatever pattern you want for your fabric will be formed row by row. And this is really similar to if you've ever been on a website and an image is loading really slowly, loading in actually rows of pixels. So being able to control individual threads is actually a lot like being able to control individual pixels. And this is a portrait of uh, Joseph Marie Jacquard, uh, the inventor of the Jacquard loom. Um, this was woven in silk in 1839. And actually, dozens of these were woven from the same set of punch cards. And they were sent all over Europe. Most people at this time had never seen a photograph. So you can kind of imagine that this level of detail it's pretty amazing, uh, especially in silk. So you can kind of think of this as a Victorian-era viral marketing campaign. And Charles Babbage had to have one of these. And this brings me to what is so amazing about the Jacquard loom. It's programmable. This weaving machine inspired Charles Babbage to invent the analytical engine. This is the first general purpose computer. Machines up to this point would carry out a specific function or calculation, but using a punch card system, we could actually um, carry out any number of functions without altering the mechanics. Some of you might remember uh, the programming with punch cards on mainframe computers. Uh, they were the precursors to the laptops that we have today. <laughs> Stepping back a bit, you can think of even the most basic loom as a precursor to the modern computer. Both weaving and compu computing can be boiled down to a binary system, which means they rely on just two states. For weaving, this is the weft going above and below the warp, and for computing, this is zeros and ones. Email, internet, all the apps on your phone are all made of just zeros and ones. And we call these bits of data. So weavers are like computers because they process their own bits of data and translate them into something that is visually meaningful to humans. You can see a similar pattern in knitting. The woman who taught me to knit, Barkley Dunn, was also a programmer at the company where I worked. We uh, 
met once a week over lunch to, uh, to knit together, and it never occurred to me that these parts of her life might be related. But eventually, I was learning to program, and I started to notice all these similarities between knitting and what I was learning in, in class. So for example, when you learn to knit, the first thing you learn is a two-dimensional array, also known as a matrix, and you might know it as a scarf. So let me explain. An array is a set of something, and in this case, it's a set of stitches. A 2D array, a two-dimensional array, is a set of sets. And the width of a scarf is determined by the width of the first uh, row of stitches. This is um, a, an array of stitches. And the length of the, the scarf is determined by the number of rows. So a scarf is a two-dimensional array of stitches. So I just used uh, knitting to explain a data structure and a data structure to explain knitting. So once you've mastered your two-dimensional array, you probably want to move on to some three-dimensional structures. Socks, hats, mittens, sweaters, and these require calculations that can get fairly complex. So uh, we have a system of shorthand that we use to communicate these instructions. This is called a knitting pattern. And these are the instructions to make this hat. These patterns also resemble computer code. So someone who is used to reading and writing in the syntax of knitting patterns would actually be in an excellent position to learn a programming language. And yet, they aren't necessarily the people that we imagine when we imagine a programmer. So, Craft has been a tool for me to find my way into the tech space. And technology, in turn, has led me back to craft. I've become fascinated by just the complex relationships and systems that exist between craft and technology. So I've even come up with my own word to describe it. Cybernetics. <laughs> During my master's uh, thesis research, I set out to kind of illustrate this idea of cybernetics. And I wanted to answer one fundamental question. Will cyborgs knit? <laughs> I developed a wearable device for the crafter of the future. As the wearer knits, the device tracks and sonifies their hand movements. So the natural rhythm of knitting becomes a rhythm that you can hear and the result is very um, mindful and calming. And it connects the wear more closely to the process of knitting as opposed to uh, when we think of just the result. And this brings me to the title of my talk, The Future is Soft. In proving that cyborgs will knit, I must also prove that crafting uh, has, a, has a place in the future. There is a false assumption that technology is, uh, will become so advanced that we no longer want or need to make things by hand. But actually, craft and tech coexist. Technology, more than any other modern industry, would benefit from more viewpoints. If we do away with the artificial separation between tech and craft, it becomes clear that crafters are some of the most qualified people to provide these viewpoints. Tech and craft both permeate our lives in more ways than we realize. And if we can bring these two seemingly disparate groups together, imagine the brilliant minds that we can bring into this space. Now, remember earlier when I told you that three out of four middle school-aged girls expressed an interest in science, engineering, and math, but didn't carry that interest through a, a higher education? According to a recent study by Facebook and McKinsey, three out of four parents or guardians do not know how to help their child pursue a degree in computer science. 
So let's get rid of the idea that anybody has to fit into a mold to get into that space. And I will leave you with this thought. If you can weave, you can think like a computer. And if you can knit, you can program. And if you can sew, you can engineer. And as long as you are thinking and creating, you are valuable and you belong. <laughs>